blood flow restriction training. So what is blood flow restriction? Blood flow restriction is gonna be working out at low loads, so 20 to 30% of the one RM, um, while limiting blood flow to the muscle and completely occluding it from uh, exiting the muscle. And uh, so by doing this, we can see adaptations from exercise that are kind of synonymous with what you would see from high load training. But we don't have to put that crazy high load on somebody's body, the risk of injury, and stuff like that. Um, so the actual restriction is going to be about up to 70 to 80 percent of the arterial blood flow, so the blood flow away from the heart to the muscle, and then completely blocking the blood flow out of the muscle. Um, and these adaptations that we're going to see that I'm going to talk about is going to be hypertrophy and muscle strength. So where did this come from? Um, this was originated from Dr. Yoshiaki Sato in 1966. He was at a religious festival and he was doing a lot of praying where he was kneeling for extended periods of time. And he noticed that through like the blood not being able to get to his calf muscles, he was experiencing a pump that you would see at like a normal resistance exercise. And uh, so he was kind of trying to figure out what was going on. Um, he started gathering what he could, bike tubes, ropes, bands, anything that he could tie around his arms, his legs, trying to find what worked best, like what was going on. Um, so eventually he developed this into like a more safe and effective training process. He was getting the adaptations that he was going for. Um, and he named it Katsu training. And Katsu in Japanese is additional pressure or increasing pressure. And so funnily enough, he, um, he had a ski accident and well that's not my he had a ski accident, just the, just the, uh, the situation of it all. He had a ski accident and he fractured his ankle. Um, and they put him in a cast and they gave him a six month recovery timetable. And so he used his blood flow restriction. He did 30 second bouts of isometric exercises just three times a day. And um, he saw fully, he was fully recovered in six weeks. And incredibly enough, he had zero muscle atrophy of his leg. From being in a cast for six weeks, you would you would assume that the muscle would weaken, and it, it didn't at all. So this is the actual equipment. We have um, the pressure modulator here, the tubes that are going to connect these bands, and inside these bands, they have um, a plastic lining uh, or like a bladder that is going to that's going to pump up, and then it's going to occlude the pressure. And this is actually Dr. Sato here, and at the time of this picture, he's about 70 years old, um, so it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, that's the whole entire apparatus there. You have the modulator on the hip, the tubes going up to the bands, and bands on the upper arm. And so these are the alternatives. Um, this is what you should not do. This is just tying something around your arm to get those benefits, um, or, or chasing those benefits. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with this is just not what you should do at all. Um, and then these are kind of more just like a physical band. Um, they have actually been shown in research studies to be like very close to the, uh, the ones that we just saw. But then again, you can't control exactly the pressures that you're going to be doing. So it's, it's just not recommended as well. But the, um, the other apparatus, it goes for about $1,000 with the modulator and the and the band, so when the price is that high, this is what people are gonna to turn to. So as far as the actual physiology of this, um, the processes that we're gonna see, uh, there's two predominant theories. Again, these are theories, this is not, it's, it's still very new with as far as research and, that, and the application of it. So it's gonna be metabolic byproduct accumulation in the working muscle. So when we have muscle contractions, there's metabolic byproducts that are produced and they're usually cleared out by the circulation of the blood. But since we're blocking the circulation of the blood, the metabolic byproducts are gonna kind of form up in the muscle. And then this, this is going to cause them to fatigue quicker. So as certain muscle fibers are fatigued, they have to call on other muscle fibers to continue to do the work and produce the, the action that you're trying to get to, trying to get it to do. And um, so it's going to call on motor neurons that are going to have to call on other muscle fibers and then eventually the whole entire muscle is going to be fatigued and we'll reach our goal of the resistance training. And so the second one is cell swelling. 
So there's volume sensors in the cells that are going to kind of start this cascade of um, activity in the body. So it's going to spur the G proteins, which are going to activate tyrosine kinases, which are eventually going to activate the mTOR pathway, which is going to eventually end in muscle protein synthesis through translation. So what that's gonna do is it's going to help produce things like take away inhibitors and stuff like that, that help with turning RNA into amino acids eventually being packaged into proteins. And then the MAPK pathway is going to help with transcription, so that's going to help with turning the DNA into the RNA. So they kind of work together with that. And so this is just a visualization of the metabolic byproduct accumulation. So with A here, we have blood flow going in and out. Um, the muscle fibers aren't really being fatigued because you're at such a low load. And then with B here, you have the blood flow restriction where the metabolic byproducts are accumulating in the muscle. You can kind of see here that a third of the muscle is being fatigued and then in C, it needs to call on more muscle fibers because the, the byproduct accumulation is kind of interfering with the muscle contractions. And then in D, you have complete muscle activation, which is going to lead to fatigue and then that's gonna to lead to better growth. And then these are some of the actual byproducts. You have lactic acid, ADP, inorganic phosphate, chloride, and potassium. So this is going to be the visualization of the cell swelling. So we're going to be focusing on this branch here. This is the sensor protein, or this, the sensors in the cells are going to activate these proteins, which is going to end up with S6 kinase being activated, which is a marker of mTOR activity, just like we just talked about with, uh, it's going to end protein metabolism. And then this one is based off of this model here, but it's more specific for blood flow restriction. So with the, the first one here, the one in the middle, it's going to be just with blood flow restriction. So there's more liquid in the cells, and then you have your intracellular metabolites building up, which is gonna cause the cell to swell a little bit more, activating the mTOR pathway, ending in protein synthesis. And then at the end there, you have VFR with exercise. So you're gonna have even more liquid in the cells because the blood can't get out of the, of the muscle cell. And then you have extra metabolites from the muscle contractions, which is going to cause the muscle to swell up even more. And then that's gonna activate the mTOR pathway and um, end in protein synthesis. And then you have the MAPK pathway, which is going to help with gene expression. So these are just, I'm gonna have some studies um, that we're gonna look at. So for, in terms of hypertrophy, we have uh, Sugarto et al. in uh, 2017, they had 18 subjects. They had a high load group that exercised at 70% of their 1RM, a low intensity with BFR, which was 30% of 1RM with BFR, and then low intensity, which was just the 30% of 1RM. And the high load group did three reps, 12, or three sets, 12 reps, two minutes rest in between. And the low load group did one set of 30 reps, and then they did three sets of 15 with 30 seconds rest in between. And then it was a five week study. They only resistance trained twice a week and they were doing bicep curls. And the results in the arm circumference, you can see here that in uh, centimeters, the high intensity group, they increased by 1.58 centimeters on average. And then the low intensity with blood flow restriction was increased by 1.48. But as you can see here with low intensity, they only saw 0.32. So we were seeing about five times greater growth with uh, the high intensity and the low intensity of blood flow restriction, but more importantly, the high intensity and the blood flow restriction group were similar, which is what we were kind of going for. And then so as far as strength gains go, um, this study here by Laurentino et al. in uh, 2012, you had 29 subjects three groups, um, low intensity again, 20% of 1RM, low intensity with restriction, 20% of 1RM with restriction, and then high load, which was 80% of the 1RM. And then the rep scheme for both of the low loads was three sets, 15 reps, high load was three sets, eight reps, and uh, there was a one minute rest between the group sets, and then on the fourth set, um, or after four weeks, they added in an extra set because they were progressing and they, they still needed that, um, like they needed to be taxed. 
So it was an eight week study with uh, leg extensions and the results in terms of knee extension 1RM, you can see here that every single group significantly improved. But um, as you can see over here, the low load and the high load group significantly improved more like as a, as a result of percent change than the low load group. And then also right here, you can see the quadricep cross-sectional area was significantly increased in only the, the low load with restriction group and the high in the high, uh, high intensity group. And that's it. Yeah. Are there any like certifications out there for it? Or? The, the, Katsu, the, uh, the Katsu website, they have $250 to take class, get certified. Because this feels like something so dangerous to just have out there in the world. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I'm not completely sold on it myself, but doing a lot of this research, digging through uh, research studies, there's a lot of conflicting research, but there have been a lot that have shown that it is something worth looking into. Yeah, it feels like it'd be more something towards like the physical therapy side of things where yeah. for people injured, that makes sense. It's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you can use it with like elderly patients because uh, you, you obviously don't want to put those huge loads on them, but, the, but if you do the blood flow research, you can see similar results. Did you see anything in research with like youth athletes or anything like that? Uh, they did not do any research on youth, no. Which I think is <laughs> Let's figure it out for adults first before we... Yeah. 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 What was the like highest percent of like RM that you saw people working with this? With the... the like I know most of them said like 20 to 30 percent. Yeah. Um, it, like you can go to 40 percent. The, the 20, yeah, it's... The people are kind of trying everything. Like I said, like it's not completely figured out yet. So, I mean, as long as we're doing it safe, then I guess you can do that. But yeah, 20 to 30 percent is the recommended. But I have seen 40. Though. Did you see anyone doing it with like high loads? Oh no, 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 no. I mean, I'm sure people have tried, but not in a research study. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> jumping. This is exciting. Though. Wow, to take this on as a, as a, a uh, something to present wow good for you it's big mm -hmm. you know but i've seen this you know over 35 years in this in this industry you know each time i see something like this i go oh boy that's scary i wouldn't touch that no offense but i would i would have gone with the knee much quicker than this because it's a bold move to take this on but it's cool that's how we that's how we advance in this mm -hmm. stuff you know um i am so incredibly skeptical with this for so many reasons and i'm going to start off with the, the Laurentine or at all the 2012 um, to me that's just a faulty research paper mm -hmm. you know if you look at the details and just the little ones that you, you presented um, you know high intensity well it's not supposed to be like that you know we clearly overtrained one minute we're not we're getting recovered mm -hmm. you know so that's one thing to look at so right there I just look at it and, I, and automatically and my one of my masters is in exercise science and the other is kinesiology so I look I look at it and I go right there it's a faulty study you know, so something we want to pick up on as we go, but you did a good job collecting what's out there. Yeah. Again, that's it's super ballsy move, I'm gonna say, to take this on because it is so so new and cool. Um, but this is what PhDs do, you know, so it seems like we're down the right path here. So to try to defend this is pretty cool, yeah. Um, so, but there there's one strike against it right there. You know, the transfer of training to me is scary. As an as an athletic trainer, I will say that to train athletes, really, I don't need bigger muscles. I need more functional muscles. And you know, when there's no excitation from the neuromuscular system, aren't we closing off that pathway? So yeah, we're building muscle, right? And we're collecting a lot of junk in there that needs to be cleaned out, right? Because we know an overload or excessive overload of that shuts the kidneys down, damages the organs eventually. If it's like Mary said, for physical therapy, it's one thing. But as athletes, I'm kind of scared of this. To train athletes. Where's the transfer of training? What is the percentages? What are the variables? Things that we have learned through periodization, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to justify this, right? It's uh, it's it's actually being used in professional sports today. Um, <laughs> Dwight Howard actually, he had a knee injury, he had a meniscus, I think, and he he recovered through blood flow restriction. So there, I, there we are. In physical therapy, I think, yeah, that sounds good, right? So as a physical therapist, I'm going, 
okay, why not? Why, why not cut this time down by a third? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, or two thirds. Yeah, let's you know, it's worth a shot. You know. Yeah, I can't um, see this being like functional and like yeah, a, a setting right. like this. Yeah, I know. Be, yeah, that's yeah. my concern. That's where I'm going. With yeah, this. I, I think the, the better application for it is in the, the elderly, the people that yes. um, yeah. they're rehabbing stuff like that. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, there's a lot of variables there, too. I mean, over, you know, obesity is a big thing in America, especially. So you have the elderly population. They're all skin. You know, there's no, how do you cut that off without cutting off the brachia? You know, I mean, all sorts of secondary. Yeah, just a lot of issues out there. Again, this is a bold move taking this on, and I'm not trying to make you defend it. Defend it. I'm just going, wow, there's a lot of stuff to go seek, seek more information on, and it's not out there. Yeah, and, and no, I'm not personally defending it. I just, I really do think that, like, it's just something. But you present something, you own it. So, you know, you better, <laughs> you know, you yeah, better. I just wanted to shed light on what it is and, and what it could be and the fact that, like, we, like, it, it would be used to, like, looking into it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, these studies, I, I looked through so many studies where it was 10 participants, like, five per group. And yeah. if we can get more studies with 50 or 30 even, that would be, that would help out. Did you see anything where there were people getting like injured doing it or any like inherent risk or long term effects or anything? There was dropout, maybe like one or two. It's it's like that almost with every study. Yeah. People they have their reasons for dropping out of a study. So and and they don't really like prod too much into that. They'll tell you, um, like, oh it was because of this, but that's just what the participant told them and research can only go so far with that. So it has its limitations. Yeah, the long-term risk of just cutting your blood flow off like that, that's scary. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not the, it's not the whole entire time. It's just through the working set. So, yeah. But, yeah, no, I agree. It's just the main takeaway from this, I think, is just we need to look into it a little bit. And, and man, that's why I think you're right on board with this, and that's why I think it's such a bold move, such a cool thing to, to present on. You know, I, when you said crazy high load, of course, that got my head for me. Like, <laughs> enough. well, you know, we have to have a crazy high load and in athletics, whether you like it or not, depending, you know, um, almost every sport, you know, I'm not sure about golf, but, you know, <laughs> sport, <not> the hobby, <laughs> right? No, I'm kidding, because we look at Bryson DeChambeau and see what he's doing, oh, muscle okay. activation, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, this is changing, but this is how we change it, so you young folks are changing this, and this is very cool, and again, no offense to you, what you you presented was very cool, because, you, you know, we're looking at the future, you know, there's other things, but... You know, this is exciting. I'd like to see where this goes in five years. Yeah. It's been dragging around quite a while, and I just think, I think personally that this won't gain a whole lot of traction because people like us, and both of us have master's degrees, and we're looking like this. We're like, ooh, hands off, I'm scared. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, get your PhD on this and, and push it forward. You could probably be a millionaire in 10 years, mm-hmm. you know, just from this subject because I think there's something there, you know, and it's just how do we control it? How do we, how do we scale it? You know, how do we create variables and how do we create a program that supports all of it? So that's pretty cool stuff, man. It gets my geekness like way up, you know? Because, mm-hmm. I mean, imagine if you could get this to be safe for athletes. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, just for PT alone, you know, really? That's where I, I see this. But, man, if you can transfer that, because we, we steal from PT, right, as coaches. We steal from them all the time. We probably couldn't do our job without them. Because they're the ones that validate everything. You know? We just... <laughs> We throw a football at them, you know, and catch the hoo good job. <laughs> Not really, but those of us that are a little geeky about this, this is cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Oh, you yeah. can get you can get lost in this research for hours. It's just one study. I'm afraid to. Another study yeah. to another study yeah. to another one. Yeah, the, I mean, you know, they're mostly current, so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to five years from now reading this, mm-hmm. or when you hit PhD, send me a copy of what you're, what you're doing. 